Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I'm not sure what is the subject I'm supposed to speak about. <laughs> Just <laughs> legacies of leadership. I was once asked to give the inaugural lecture at the Kennedy School in Harvard on a series called Leadership. I had not thought about the subject. I think I know what a leader is, having met many in my life, both political leaders, military leaders, corporate leaders. But as there was going to be several authors of books on leadership who would be at the Kennedy School, I decided it might be wise for me to read what they have written and what it's all about. So I looked them up in Google. Enormous voluminous tomes. Just to review or summarize, one of them will take me half an hour, if not more. So I will just try and encapsulate what I think they all mean by leadership. It is the ability to, to convince, to persuade people to follow a course of action which you believe is good for them and will achieve something which they would desire. Now, there are different kinds of leadership. One is where you are not in a hierarchy and you have to be supported or elected. That's a different kind of leadership. The other is where you are the three-star general or a four-star general and everybody has got less number of stars or other pips on, your sh on their shoulders or stripes and they just got to follow you. But even then, you require certain qualities to be able to inspire confidence that when you order them to do something, they know that you have thought it over, that it is doable, that they are not being, as the American phrase goes, recklessly put in harm's way. Leadership varies with time and circumstance. And the subject I know best is what constitutes political leadership. If you read the present media, you'd say that the world is bereft of great leaders. Uh, there was no Winston Churchill or Roosevelt or Stalin or Charles de Gaulle. In my lifetime, they were great men. I lived my, trop my most impressionable years when they made massive decisions that decided the shape of the post-war world. What did they have in common? An ability to communicate. Most of all, Winston Churchill. I heard him on radio when Britain was looking as if it was going to be captured. And I heard him, and it was a rousing, indomitable, defiant speech that galvanized the people, bought the British time, I think inspired his RAF pilots, and so they won the Battle of Britain, bought time, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, America came into the war, and the rest was history. The one who I would admire most after Churchill in my lifetime would be Charles de Gaulle. Uh, I don't know French. 
but I read of him. And he saved the honor, the ammo prop of France because it was a captured, defeated country. But as France went down, he, he left, went to London, adopted by Winston Churchill, and he broadcast it. But he was never Churchill's protege. He was the most irascible, difficult, uncontrollable leader of the Free French Forces. But he was a leader. Years later, I read his biography, not in French, but in English, a translation. And I was fascinated. Here was a man whose country has been captured, was able to wear his uniform and try and form free French forces with whatever remnants of French troops or airmen or sailors who escaped. And when the Americans landed in North Africa, and they were in Algiers, Algiers was then part of Vichy France and was captured. He went up to the French general in charge and guarding the French general were American troops. He went up, he went in and says, he berated the man and says, you are a general of France. Why do you have American troops guarding you? <laughs> His impudence without the American troops. He was a puppet of the Germans. But he had that courage, that spirit. And he went back to France. And the Americans and the British decided it would be good for France and for them that the French, free French forces would liberate Paris. They having sacrificed the majority of their forces at Normandy. And he gave French, the French people an alibi. So whenever they are accused of having collaborated with the Germans, he was evidence of the spirit of resistance. That's a very great man. And when France collapsed in a series of revolving door governments, he came back in 1957. Got himself properly elected by the legislature, as the, adopted as the president, changed the constitution and governed France and restored what he called was grandeur. Do you have such people today? But do you need such people today? If you look around the world, you say, what kind of leaders do you need? If you look at China, without Mao, Mao Zedong, maybe China would not have been so easily uh, liberated, as they call it, and the KMT defeated, and the People's Republic pronounced on the 1st of October 1949, and they said, the Chinese people have stood up. But had he continued I think China would have been in a parlous condition. So fortunately for China, the man he rusticated, Deng Xiaoping, came back from the wilderness, pushed aside Hua Kuofeng. In 1978, he visited Bangkok, Kuala Lumpur, and Singapore. 
to persuade us to combine with China and stop Vietnam, the Cuba in Southeast Asia of the Soviet Union when they were about to attack Cambodia. I had the privilege of meeting him, meeting him, talking to him for three days. And he is, in my lifetime, the most impressive man I've ever met. Small, barely five feet, stood erect, tremendous aplomb, man of few words, but carefully thought, every few words carefully thought out. He spent one hour after all the ride from the airport back to the office and to his uh, villa. We met in the afternoon and I think one hour plus translation because I never deal in any negoci negotiations in Chinese without a translation because I will be at a disadvantage. <laughs> so it took nearly two hours. And I noticed his interpreters did not take notes, but they gave almost verbatim correct explanation translation of what he said. So my surmise was that he made the same spiel in Bangkok, in Kuala Lumpur, <laughs> and this was the third rehearsal. <laughs> so the translators knew it by heart. When he finished, urging us why we should combine and stop Vietnam from imperiling the rest of Southeast Asia. It was about half past six, I said, would you like me to respond now? Or would you like to rest, have dinner, and when we are fresh tomorrow, we can talk? He thought I wanted to have time to think what, <laughs> about what he had said, which is partly true. Just so like, we'll have dinner. So we spent the evening talking and I said, you must come to Beijing again. I'm sorry I wasn't there when you came. I was kept out of the capital. <laughs> I went there and I, in May 1976 to meet Mao Zedong and he wasn't there. But I said, never mind, come again. I said, when China has stabilized and growing, I will come again. So, oh, that will take a very long time. Come now. He's <laughs> <laughs> a very forthright man. So I decided the next day that I'll come straight to the point. I told him, you have explained to me why we should all combine in Southeast Asia and join you in blocking the Vietnamese who are wicked and wanted to capture Cambodia. Now, I will tell you what my neighbors want to do. They want me to join them and confront you, not the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is thousands of miles away, and the Soviet Union has no broadcasting station, egging, urging, agitating, communist parties in Southeast Asia to overthrow their governments. You are from your radio stations in South China. I did not know then that the radio stations were not in Yunnan, but in Changsha and Hunan, which we later discovered. Said, and as long as you are doing that and sending them money to buy arms and doing all these things, it's most unlikely that I'll be able to persuade them to join you. So, having met Hua Kofeng in Beijing, in a long encounter, 
I had expected a blustering reply. Because Hua Kofong, he, he captured me after sending me off to the Great Wall. I went to the Great Wall, then they gave me lunch after the, at the Ming tomb, so hot, dusty. I downed beer, then I arrived back at the guest house at Tiao Yi Tai. I said, meeting. Oh, <laughs> this was regular. Having had to deal with communists in Singapore, I knew exactly what they were up to. They first made me tired. <laughs> and they said, now we'll have a meeting. So I said, OK, right. I said, I'll wash up first, wound up, clean up, freshen up, drank a lot of Chinese tea, <laughs> sat down and listened to him. I said, now I have something very serious to talk to you. I hear you are in military alliance with Taiwan. I said, oh? He says, yes, your troops are there. So he went on a great speed. He says, but Taiwan belongs to China. I said, yes, we know that. <laughs> but the de facto control is with the nationalist government, and I have to go there and deal with them. So he says, it's a very serious matter. I said, we are not training with the Taiwanese troops. We are not in alliance with Taiwan. We're just training by ourselves because we are so small. If we fire our artillery guns, they go 20 miles. We're already across our border. <laughs> so we have to go somewhere. I said, I decided to counterattack. I said, by the way, you told me yesterday that communists never interfere in the activities of other countries. Why are you giving arms and support to the Malayan Communist Party to overthrow the Singapore government? <laughs> so, he was not briefed on this. <laughs> so his foreign minister wrote up a long note for him. He just pushed it aside. He knew there was no chance his reading it, mastering the facts, and then arguing with me. So he pushed it aside, says, never mind. But let me tell you this. Wherever communists fight, they will win. <laughs> so I had expected Deng Xiaoping to tell me something like that. He paused. Closed his eyes, looked at me, and said, What do you want me to do? <laughs> I took a deep breath and I said, This man can do business. <laughs> I said, Stop it. Change your policy. Then we'll join you and stop the Vietnamese. He paused, he said, Give me time. And it took 18 months before I met him again in Beijing. And he said, we have told them they must stop. We have closed down the radio stations. We are not giving them any more support. Now I've read Jinping's book. Jinping was the leader of the Communist Party in Malaya. And he's written up, or he gave an oral biography to a Daily Telegraph correspondent who's retired <coughs> and has written up his side of the story. And in it, he explained that Teng Xiaoping called him up and told him, I'm very sorry. Lee Kuan Yew has told me that if you don't close down your station, then the Khmer Rouge will lose his seat in the United Nations. I said, and then we'll be in trouble. So, according to Jinping, he did his quick calculation, said, well, this is 
The answer must be yes. <laughs> so he says, oh, can we go on till another year? So he says, no, you must stop now. At, as soon as possible. So he says, can I take away the equipment? He says, take everything you want. But Chin Peng says they were so heavy and big. How could he take it to the jungles? So I think they must have given him some money and he bought portable Japanese equipment. But that was a leader. He did his calculations. He decided this was in China's interest to stop Vietnam. He had to cut his communist comrades. Can't be helped. But he cut it in a way which was different from the Americans. When the Shah of Iran was ousted and he was traveling around the world looking for medical treatment, he had a lot of trouble getting permission to go to America to get treatment. The Chinese, with long experience, 5,000 years of knowing how to make friends and allies and you never know, day after tomorrow you will need them made sure that they did not leave hostile to him, hostile to China. So set them up, good luck, good wishes. And every time any communist leader of the Milan Communist Party is ill, he goes to China, full treatment, free of charge. That's leadership. Without him, had Mao's policies carried on, I think China would be in the position of the Soviet Union. It would have imploded, and that's the end of the story. It did not implode. He did not listen to the advice given, gratuitous advice given why he should democratize and so on. Glasnost, Perestroika, he did it his own way. First, a few free trade zones, then successful, expand, then privatize or lease out the farms. And 1992, he went on a southern tour, Nanshun, said, press on. And today, 2005, you have the phrase, peaceful rise of China, helping Chue Chi. That's real leadership. He listened to all the sincere advice given to him by Americans and Europeans, <laughs> decided what was good for China, and stuck to it. And I think the present leadership in China not cast in a heroic mold because you don't want to fight America, you don't want to fight the Soviet Union, you want peace, you want quiet, you want to be friends with ASEAN, even with the Japanese if it's possible, to grow. And every year you grow stronger, your economy grows, your technology grows, and there's a spin-off eventually on space, submarines, etc. And you extrapolate this 10 years, 20 years, and you see the gap between Japan and China will narrow. The gap between America and China will begin to close. Then say 2030 or 2040, then they say, anti-secession law, let's talk. And you must talk. So it's a matter of time. I think it shows a certain uh, patience, a certain realistic appraisal of the present position, a certain recognition that an unnecessary collision now would derail 
the whole church, peaceful rise, helping church. So they have a leadership that's geared to achieve that. So in other words, leadership depends upon the mood of a people at a given time, the situation the country is in, and the policies that those, the set of leaders must achieve to advance and promote the interests of the people and of the country. Uh, in Singapore, I lived through turbulent times. <laughs> it was life and death whether Singapore could make the grade on its own after its cut off from Malaysia, from Malaya, or Malaysia. But by 1990, when I stepped down, that was not the issue. The issue now is, can Singapore continue to upgrade its people, educate, train, innovate, upgrade its economy, revamp itself, and have a leadership that inspires a younger generation, no longer deprived, widely traveled, comfortable in their homes, knowledgeable of the outside world, but with still fire in their bellies to achieve. It requires a different leadership. I can't do it. And it's up to the next generation. So, so it is with every country. As you see in, in Japan, you have Koizumi, who have decided quite clearly that Japan is going to be a normal country, that the self-defense force will become a full-fledged defense force, he sent troops to Iraq, he's come out explicitly with the Americans that Taiwan is a crucial issue of peace and stability in, that concerns the U.S. and Japan. Does it reflect the wish of the Japanese people? Probably does, because I think they're somewhat uneasy about the kind of relationship that will develop between them and China as China continues its phenomenal growth and in 20, 30 years will overtake Taiwan and will overtake Japan. So leadership depends on time, place, circumstance, the needs of a people, and a group of leaders or a leader who's able to articulate what, they, what he thinks will be good for them and will bring them forward. What you want in Hong Kong, I don't know because I don't live here, uh, but I think apply what I have said, look at your circumstance, look at the possibilities and say, within this framework, what can be achieved for the maximum benefit of the people of Hong Kong. And good luck to you. Thank you.